Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Having, having uh, gone through the story of how Belize ended up being a British occupied territory that led to a colonization by the British, unlike our our um, Central American counterparts. Uh, we enter into another story and this narrative is on the Maya who, who were uh, the inhabitants of the territory upon the coming of the Europeans, the Spaniards and subsequently the British. So, um, we're starting a new story. And um, as with all our Belizean narratives, our homeland narratives, it's a sacred moment uh, that brings us to terms with our historical past, uh, who we are and where we're moving to. Uh, as as um, we begin the story, I would like to share with you uh, uh, a piece, uh, uh, a video clip uh, of on a South American song, a very, very popular in, in South America. Um, this song uh, kind of shares the story of the people. Uh, it's a story uh, rooted in in um, in social disturbance um, due to exploitation uh, uh, and the the suffering of of the people. It's a it's a song uh, that portrays a theme of a, of peace. Um, whereby it brings us to reflect on our own story that we are living as Belizeans and how the present situation is in part due to the decisions and the actions of those who have come before us, those who have been in government, our leaders, and how these decisions uh, can um, in the end produce a good results and not so good results. Um, the, the, the clip you are going to see is the, the, depicts the composer of the song. Uh, it's in Spanish. Solo le pido a Dios, I only ask God. I only ask the Lord. And um, he is accompanied by the, the symphony of, of, of the blind. All these musicians are blind, are, um, are, um, e, son ciegos, no? So, um, so I invite you to, to um, appreciate the song, to listen to the lyrics and reflect on what we see, what you see, what you hear.
Thank you, Justin. Um, I guess I shared the, the the version of this that was not it was not a close up one, but that's fine. You can you can look at the the other version of the same song. And YouTube, he's um, the guy is from Argentina, and it's a very popular song. Um, I would like to introduce to you Delmar Sib, Mr. Delmar Sib. He's a he's a teacher, a lecturer at um, St. John's College in Belize City, um, teaching Belizean uh, studies history. And um, like last year, he was very uh, open and disposed to, to teaching, to lecturing on the story, the narrative of the Mayan resistance against British colonization, the caste war and the subsequent a resistance here in the um, territory of uh, Belize um, against the British. Uh, part, partly the cause of the British eventually declaring a Belize a colony, crown colony in 1864. Is, so I will leave um, now the space to Delmar. And this uh, 60 minute lecture will focus principally on the caste war and then part two will come on Wednesday. 
So, bienvenido, um, welcome, Delmar, and the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can you give me the ability to share the screen so that I can um, share my screen? Okay, um, Justin, can you do that, please? Okay, so even before I start my presentation, I would like to say that um, in the 1800s, uh, a lot of historians tend to highlight that the contact between the British and the Maya uh, basically have four phases or has four phases. The first phase is when there is an initial contact and primarily that occurred in the, in, the, um, in the early years where the Maya had retreated inland and um, the British were of course cutting Lagood and Mahogany in the areas or in the coastal areas and slowly moving towards the west. The second phase is when there's a little bit more skirmishes, you could say, or more, uh, a little bit of more contact, whereby, although the British initially would say that the Maya posed no threat to them, uh, the Maya would have sporadic attacks and so forth. Then you would also have the third phase, and, and third, and then eventually have the fourth phase. The third phase is where, which starts at 1847, uh, where you have a lot more violent confrontations between the British and the Maya, a lot more attacks happening and so forth. And that's precisely the phase that we're going to be talking about. Um, not precisely today. However, I do want to make a connection that this particular phase that historians outline is also the phase that coincides to an extent with what is also happening in the region, which is the Kaswar in Yucatan. Uh, the Kaswar in Yucatan had a direct impact on our history and a direct impact on the settlement and composition uh, of our uh, country as it is today. So let me just um, share my screen so that I can start the presentation. Again, trying to make the point that that's one of the first reasons as to why we should talk about the Kaswar. Uh, there has been much debate about why this is, isn't a big part of the curriculum, but um, it is something important, especially for people or for us in the West, for people in, in up North, because the migrations that were created as a result of the Cas War basically populated these parts of the world. So I'm going to begin again. My name is Delmer Zib. I am from San Antonio, actually, San Antonio, Cayo. And um, I've been a student of history almost all my life. Uh, from the age of 13, I uh, found a deep love for history. And part of it actually stemmed from the idea that I wanted to know who am I and, and where am I going to an extent. And part of the reason as to, or part of the answer lies in the Kaswar itself. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the Kaswar. Um, I'm going to be looking primarily at three things. One, identifying the key players in the Kaswar. Two, examining three causes of the Kaswar. Now, whenever I, I talk about the three causes, I am generalizing to an extent because it is very difficult for us to take a look at every single thing about this Kaswar. And lastly, we're going to be looking at a breakdown of the key events leading up to the beginning of the Cas War. Again, I want to clarify that it is impossible for me to cover every single aspect of this war. Uh, actually, there are universities that give a full semester uh, in some areas in Yucatan, just dedicated to the Cas War because of the many confrontations and the complex events that were occurring as well. So I want to begin my presentation primarily by taking a look at this mural. Now, I like to... Um, Ask people, what do you see? Actually, you can answer if you, you can turn on your mic and answer or, or answer in the chat. What do you see? This is a mural located in Corozal, done by Manuel Villamor. Delmar, excuse me, can, can you um, blow up your... Oh, you can't screen? see properly? I mean, it, it's, we see all the slides. Um, if you can just put it on slideshow so that it can... Okay, expand. no problem, no problem. I thought that it was legible, but um, does that work? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so what do you see here? What happened? Um, yes. I see right there, George Price. Okay, George Price. Excellent. The Belize flag. The Belize flag. What else? Yeah, a flyer that says like a post just tick packs, like a little flag at the corner, the right. A little flag at the corner, okay. What else? Are, what else? Yes, you can continue sharing. Slide, slide to BH. 
BH, fly to BH, okay. I think it's the Maya fighting with the British over there. Yeah, there. Right there? Okay, yeah, that's... the Maya's a little bit lower. Oh, right here? Yeah. Okay. I think... <laughs> No, I mean, you're, you're, you're all right. You're just describing. What, what else do you see? Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's the Spanish church being burned down in the left corner. Okay, a Spanish church. Anyone else? One is more. That, and then. Is that the church from that was burned in Lamanai? I, 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 it's not precisely the church in Lamanai, but... Um, but um, what this basically is saying is that it, it's partially telling the story of Corozal, trying to state the, the story of, of Belize, particularly as a result of the Caso War. So the people that you see, they are not necessarily the, the British, they're the, the, um, the, the Yucatecos, and we're going to discuss about them later on, um, that are confronting the Maya. And this is basically showing resistance to the Spanish and also, of course, the, the, the Yucateco and Mexican forces. But it is also showing the flight, flight, in other words, people running away. So. Again, I had stated that the people or Belize was um, inhabited by people that were running away from something. So they were refugees. And these were the refugees that came to basically form a life in, in Corozal as, as, as shown by Manuel Villamor. But what it's innately saying is that there's a deep connection between who we are and also Yucatan. And also it is a deep contribution or we could say a, a contribution towards what was and what is nation building. That's how uh, we need to understand this. It's not a story of Yucatan, it is our story as well. It is not only of Yucatan because this transcends borders and is also uh, identifying ourselves as well or identifies us as, um, as persons from or that have origins from there as well. Okay, let me begin. I am going to be open to questions probably at the end. And the reason for it is because the complex is a bit, um, I'm sorry, the story is a bit long and, and a bit complex. So who are the people in this war? Who were involved? Now, there is one clarification that I would like to make from the answer. Uh, whenever we talk about Yucatecos, uh, we always tend to think, or at least in the context of Belize, that we are referring to Yucatec Maya. The term Yucatec Maya was something that the British and the, uh, actually the government of Belize for, coined in 2001. And it was something that was used, or that term was used to refer to all the Maya that migrated from Yucatan into Belize. However, there were different Maya groups that actually migrated into, into Northern and Western Belize. So the Yucatecos that we refer to at this point are not the Yucatec Maya. I want to make that very clear. We are not referring to the Yucatec Maya whenever we say Yucatecos at this point or within this presentation. And the reason for it is because when we refer to, to Yucatecos here, we're referring to actually the people that inherited uh, the positions of power in Yucatan from the Spanish. Most of them are, are um, Spanish descendants, and they're also, uh, most of them are also from the Peninsulares caste, meaning um, the Spanish had a, a stratified social system. And at the top, you had um, people with Spanish blood, pure Spanish blood and born in Spain. These were their descendants, right? So these are the people that once Spanish colonialism ended after 1821 and so forth, and they were the ones who inherited all of the political, economic and social power. So the Yucatecos in this case, guys, are the people that are concentrated right up north, right here. And their major centers of power were Campeche, Merida, and Valladolid. And again, they, they were also known as um, the, the mestizos, we could say. They're a bit, some of them are also known to be mixed. But again, what I want to make clear here is that there is a distinction between what is a Yucateco in this context and the Yucatec Maya. In this case, the, um, these groups, are the ones that have clearer skin. They're the ones who are, the, to an extent, the owners of haciendas, the, the owners of plantations, and so forth. Then right here, if you move a bit to the, to the um, southeast, you will note that there is, a, there, there is a map. It shows red. And there is also three little crosses there. That area, guys, is an area that was controlled by a group of Maya called the Santa Cruz Maya. They were also known as Los Bravos, or also known as Cruzob. Their major city was Chan Santa Cruz. That, that became their major city, but not only their major city, but also their base of power. Now, this particular group, guys, is the one that was mainly leading the charge as it relates to fighting against the Yucatecos, which is the, the reason why you have this, the, the, this casuar itself. 
and they were the ones who resisted the longest. The caste war is something that occurred from 1847 to 1901. So that's a very, very long time. And for a large amount of time, they stood either with allies or alone to fight against the Yucatec forces. Then if you go a bit farther um, southwest, you will note that there is a yellow area right here. This yellow area is basically outlining the territory of the Ikaiche. The Ikaiche Maya uh, were basically known as Los Pacificos del Sur. And the reason for it is because they signed a treaty with the Yucatec and Mexican authorities, uh, basically uh, stating that they will not participate no longer in the, in the rebellion. Initially, the Santa Cruz or Cruzob Maya and the Ikaiche worked together to fight against the Yucatecos. But then the Ikaiche sort of, uh, you know, backed off and wanted peace. And as a result of that, another civil war within the caste war occurred where the Maya were against each other. And then, of course, in orange, you have uh, the British. Now, the British were mostly interested in extracting Laguna and Mahogany from the areas, but they were also interested in having a friendly relationship with the Maya. As a result of that, there are also indices or, or evidence that the British were also selling uh, guns and ammunition to the Chan, to, to the Santa Cruz area to fight against the Yucatec and Mexican forces. So these are the key players. Again, you have the Yucatecos, you have the Santa Cruz Maya, you have the Ikaiche Maya, and of course you also have the British who are uh, also playing a role in this regional war. So again, the major cities are Campeche, Merida, Valladolid, uh, Chan Santa Cruz, and in the case of the Ikaiche, they had a major city called Chichen Ha, that was one of their capitals. Um, so let's move on. Again, whenever we talk about the caste war, what we're referring to is, is again, something that is tired, a, a pyramid showing who has power and, and um, in an organized manner. Uh, that basically relates to social stratifications, where it's basically um, categorizing people into a hierarchy. And this hierarchy is based on wealth, status, and power. So innately, what you will notice that the people at the top are usually the smallest group. And then the, Peter, the people at the bottom are usually the largest groups. Of course, the power is concentrated at the top, um, political and economic power, that is. And of course, they make a lot of decisions based on their self-interest. And that initially, or that eventually, affects also the people that are at the bottom. So what was this caste war? This caste war was basically uh, the Maya, the indigenous people of Yucatan, the people that, are, that, that were located at the lower strands of society in this case, rebelling. In other words, they took up arms against the people of European descent. In other words, the Yucatecos. So that is basically what the caste war is. The Maya, the native Maya, rebelling against the Yucatecos. And this is basically the explosion that created a warfare that occurred from 1847 to 1901. So you're talking about over 50 years of warfare that was affecting not only Yucatan, but the whole region. So what caused this war? What could be so bad that it provoked all of this? Now, I am hopeful, or I am sure, actually, I am sure, because if you, if you have reached to the, to the caste war, it means that you have studied a bit of the Spanish colonial system. The Spanish colonial system, guys, was very clear. The Spanish colonial system was, was about the Spanish imposing their will over the people. Now, colonialism is a bit, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to call it weird, but it's a bit harsh in the sense that colonialism is not only about going there or going to another territory, and, um, and trying to dominate that group of people. But it is also about trying to convert that group of people into being like you. So one of the things that we fail to discuss a lot of times is how colonialism basically served to erase the culture of many of the groups that they, they came in contact with. And such was the case of, of, of the Maya in Yucatan. When the Spanish came into this territory, they came in to erase and to impose. What do we mean by that? The native Maya that had some sort of representation and some sort of power were removed. And then you have a systematic way of basically oppressing the Maya people. In this case, guys, there were a system of encomienda. Then of course, you will have another um, idea coming out later, peonaje. But of course, colonialism comes in the, in the sense of 
first initial warfare and confrontation between the Maya and the Spanish. Then of course, you also have disease coming along. Then what you have is a forceful control of the native population where you also have, you, you also have what you call um, forceful uh, relocation where the natives are moved from their villages or from their territories into villages that are created so that they would be looked over. So the Maya subjugation was something that occurred gradually. And that particular subjugation also entailed that they would become simply a labor force. And whenever we talk about a labor force, we need to refer to a, a ideas of slavery. And the reason for it is because the Spanish were quite aggressive sometimes with, with their workers, and they were quite forceful and leading many of these Maya to basically servitude, almost like slaves. Many, in many instances, the Maya were not um, paid. And the encomienda system in this case, and there's another parallel system called repartimiento system, was whereby um, the Spanish would receive, a Spanish conquistador that is, would receive a large parcel of land with the Maya people living on it. And his job would be to quote unquote, protect and instruct them, meaning they had to be converted to Catholicism and they also had to give, in exchange for that protection and converting to Catholicism, they had to give free labor to the, to the Spanish um, colonialists in, the, in this case. So of course, this was very, um, you're calling out or you're talking about systematic oppression. And lastly, there was a institutionalized system of uh, discrimination whereby the natives, and they were called Indios by the Spanish, were looked down upon. Their culture was looked down upon. Their language was looked down upon. Their identity basically was looked down upon. But more importantly, their political, social, and economic systems were looked down upon. So what the Spanish came in to do is basically to remove all of those natives from any sort of power and representation that they had and impose themselves as the symbols of political, economic, and social power. So of course, uh, whenever the Maya would resist to any, the, uh, any of these systems, the Spanish would respond with violence and violent discipline as well. So again, this was a frustration that, ha that, that had been present. Imagine the early contacts that, 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 that happened between the Maya and the Spanish were in the 1500s. So this is the 1800s. So you could imagine how tired of this whole system they are. And that particular frustration is one of the causes as to why the caste war basically occurred because their whole society was reorganized and this whole society, this whole reorganization basically led them to be in the lower tires of this caste system. So they were, along with the enslaved people, if you look at the, at the Spanish system of colonialism, they were at the lowest of the lowest. Basically abused, um, taken advantage of, a lot of uh, unjust treatment and so forth. So let's move on. So again, cause one, systematic oppression. Cause two, land. I just mentioned one of the, uh, one of the issues that occurred when the Spanish came in. The Spanish did what you called forceful relocations. Part of it was because they were basically wanting to convert forcefully and also control the, the, the native population. But also part of it was basically something focused with obtaining land for the production of goods. In this case, guys, um, the Spanish basically were attributing themselves the best parcels of land. And of course, this was something that was inherited by the Yucatecos. And when Mexico gained its independence, what you will notice is that they would, the, the, the Spanish would get uh, something called the latifundia and then a minifundia. That was something that was based on hacienda work. When Mexico gained its independence, there was a shift from haciendas to plantation work. In this case, guys, plantation work demanded larger parcels of land. In other words, for you to have a profitable, let's say, for example, cane field or for the production of sugar, you needed large parcels of land. And of course, the Yucatecos, who are, by the way, just to remind you guys, concentrated in the northern areas, um, begin to move farther and farther south. And the reason for it is because some of the soil up north is not conducive to the production of one, sugarcane, 
And two, another product called Henneken. Now I want to be very clear, it's not Heineken, it's Henneken, right? Um, Henneken is this particular product right down here, guys. You can see the image right there. Um, this particular plant, its fibers are actually very strong and they're, they're used to make rope. At this point as well, you know that there is a high demand for this product. And again, what you need is a large parcel of land for you to produce in a profitable manner. So the Yucatecos guys, who are the, the again, centers of power in Merida, Valladolid and Campeche, but their center, central area was Merida, began to descend on Maya lands. And they began to justify some of their um, activities by stating that the Maya, uh, you know, agriculture and Maya way of life was not necessarily conducive to quote unquote development, modernization and so forth. So the Yucatecos began to descend on the territory, disregard any rights that the Maya may have over the land itself. And they justified that displacement by saying that it's the betterment or it's for the better of everybody else or the whole um, province we could say. Now, what I want to make clear here is that when Mexico gained its independence, you sort of had different states forming with relative independence, right? With relative independence in the sense of of um, them having their own, their own government and having some sort of uh, decision-making power in their area. And although they believed, primarily the liberals in this case, they believed in equity, freedom, and so forth, they only applied some of these concepts to themselves and to their people. They did not necessarily apply it to the Maya. So again, land is also a major issue. So just to recap, systematic oppression is one. And land becomes the second one, the second major issue where the um, Yucatecos continued or descend into Maya land, the areas that were controlled by the Maya. And lastly, guys, political instability. Now, what I want to make clear is that although Yucatan um, had its own territory right there, there were also a lot of ideas clashing, political ideas at it where you had conservatives and liberals taking um, full-fledged action against each other. Now, what do I mean by full-fledged action? I do not only mean political arguments or political confrontations. I also mean military uh, arguments and military confrontations. There were cities such as Merida fighting against Campeche as well. And Yucatan on two occasions was also an independent nation. The Republic of Yucatan was from in 1840. And then later also declared itself a, another um, a republic by 1846. And the reason as to why this happened is because after 1840, later on, they decided to join Mexico again. Then in 1846, they declared their independence once more. So again, there is a lot of instability between the conservatives and liberals, between cities as well. And part of this instability also managed to arm the Maya because some conservatives and liberals, while they were fighting against each other, were basically giving um, the, the Maya people, the Santa Cruz, Sikaiche, and of course there are other Maya groups there, they were giving them guns and ammunitions to fight on their behalf. So this also, to an extent, backfired on the, on the, on the Yucatecos, because when the Maya decided to take arms, they used some of those same weapons to fight, fight against them. And lastly, guys, whenever we talk about Maya resistance, you also need to talk about um, the Maya fight for self-determination. It reached to a point where the Maya knew that this systematic oppression will not change, that they will never actually be able to govern themselves and have their own way to an extent um, in Yucatan. And as a result of that, part of their fight was not only for land, it was not for um, only for uh, fighting off this systematic oppression, but it was also to gain self-determination, meaning have their own say or own power over um, decisions that relate to themselves. And this led them to have a lot of hostility towards outsiders, particularly when outsiders encroached into their lands and into their territories. Okay, any questions? Again, if you take a look at, the, at, the, uh, about, at this cause and effect chart, what you will notice that the causes, if you sum it up, the caste system itself is a cause. Land and economy is another cause. Political instability becomes a very important 
cause and systematic oppression. And of course, these four factors led to the caste war. Any questions, guys? Del Delmar, um, how, in terms of years, how much time did it uh, take for this um, causes to come into play, you know, and, and, and kind of a... Well, I, okay, yeah. Well, well, well I think it's, it's, a, it's a, I would, in my view, it started from since uh, Spanish colonialism in the sense of the contact with the Spanish. Because one of the things that you need to understand is that the systematic oppression that occurred was sort of a, a hatred that was instilled in many of the Maya and it was passed on from generation to generation. In fact, if you take a look at the history of the region itself and Mexico itself, you know that there are many instances of resistance. And just before the caste war occurred, there was also the case of Jacinto Canek, which was also another Maya leader who basically declared himself a king. And, um, and he was again fighting for, for some sort of representation and fighting for the independence of the Maya people. So to me, all of these combined ideas basically come from even that point. But to me, the political instability and the idea of the liberals and conservatives fighting against each other from the 1820s when Mexico gained its independence, and um, it became a, a, an empire, as some of you may know. Um, that's when you have a lot more political uh, confrontations happening. Uh, and to me, that particular instability politically is what also led to this particular uh, warfare that, that, that occurred. So although I can connect it or trace it back way back to colonialism, I also think that the crucial time period here is from 1821 to the 1840s. That's when I think that most of the anger started to build up leading up to this particular war. So that would be, these would be like the long-term causes we could see. Are there any other questions or can I move on? Because what I did is I, I sort of tried to break it down into segments so that it's chewable, it's easier to understand. Okay, let me move on then. So one of the things that you need to understand about the war itself is that it started as a discussion between Maya leaders. Um, you have people such as Manuel, Manuel I, which is, um, he was one of the Maya leaders in the city of Chichimia or in the town of, or village of Chichimia. Then you have Cecilio Chi, who was again one of the leaders in the village or town of Tepic. Then you also have Jacinto Pat, who was the leader in Teosuko. So these areas, guys, or these centers were very important in the caste war. Why? Because their leaders began discussion about rebelling against this, the, the Yucatecos. And then, of course, guys, we also had Bonifacio Novello who was part of it, but he was a captain in Campeche. He was part of, you know, trying to discuss about this whole, uh, this whole idea of rebelling. And they were rebelling against these same things that we had just um, stated. They saw um, the Yucateco descendants into their territory as being a problem. And they also saw that they did not have political and also social representation, we could say, in government. And that is when they sort of came together and there is an image there by if you have any opportunity and if you have the money as well, there is actually a, a una revista a magazine uh, by, that is called Bactun and it tells the story quite quite nicely. Santiago Mendes was the Yucatecan leader governor as well, actually. His forces captured the leader of Chichimeya, Manuel I. And Manuel I, guys, was actually captured with incriminating evidence. So there was evidence that they were actually planning a rebellion. And as a result of that, he was quickly apprehended. And then, of course, he was killed by the, by the Yucatecan forces. 
And then right after that, Santiago Mendes ordered for the capture of all of the leaders that were planning this particular rebellion. And what he did is that he persecuted the other leaders, eventually attacked uh, Cecilio Chi in Tepic, but Cecilio Chi was not there. So Cecilio Chi, Cecilio Chi's ranch was attacked. Um, they killed four Maya, raped a girl. And that is when you could see that um, you know, it's starting, the war, the violence is starting. Because when Cecilio Chi noted that his ranch was attacked, of course, he hit back, right? Why can I? So Cecilio Chi basically attacked the pick, as you can see right there, in 1847. He basically executed all whites. That was his major idea, executing all the whites. And he only left girls for rape. Again, guys, these are all basically war crimes that are occurring. And then eventually you also had Jacinto Pat joining the cars from the south. And this is where you see that the Maya are starting the rebellion. With Cecilio Chi's response to Santiago Mendes, that is when you see that the Maya are starting to gain force and the rebellion is growing and the Maya are now beginning to expand their presence. The Yucatecos, the, their early uh, response was basically to attack the, the small villages in Northern Yucatan and basically also relocate some of the cities for control purposes, some of the villages, sorry, for control purposes. But the Maya guys at this point had basically gained a lot of control and they began to expand their presence and take control of Southeastern and parts of Southwestern Yucatan. So they attacked the Asenas, they attacked the plantations, destroy the plantation, burn up the plantation at, it, itself. Uh, other, Maya, other groups such as the Kokoms also joined. But um, their control was such that they had control of over 200 towns by 1847. This just simply tells you that, um, that they had amassed an amount of power very, very quickly. But to an extent, what you see happening here, guys, is that for some reason, they do not attack the major centers of power of the Yucatecos. So Merida, Fayadolid, and Campeche are not attacked at this point. But what the Maya are trying to do is to gain control of the whole area. And they went as far south as Bacalar. So take a look at there, Venancio Peck, uh, Pat, sorry, I don't know, took control and was eventually um, in Bacalar by 1848. And what I want you to understand from this is that the Maya are basically very quickly gaining control of the different areas. In the span of one year within all of this warfare that was happening, um, they had expanded their presence. And the Yucatecos, to a large extent, guys, were taken also by surprise. Uh, they sort of not or were not waiting for this response to happen. And at this point, they're also becoming a bit desperate. And the reason for it is because they were not ready militarily, we could say, to fight um, against the Maya at, at this particular point. So the Yucatecos guys, um, particularly um, Santiago Mendes resigns, the Yucatecos become desperate. In fact, um, you will know that they saw the Maya as such a threat that Valladolid becomes evacuated by 1848. And they begin to actually offer themselves to become a colony or a state controlled by the, um, even the British were in play, the Americans. So Yucatan could have potentially been a, a, a state of, of the United States, you know, because they were, they were so desperate at this point, they saw that it had basically gone out of their hands or beyond their hands. And they were requesting international aid for guns and ammunitions, even mercenaries they were requesting, but they were also reaching to a point of even saying, look, if we have to become um, a state within your country, we want to, or we can, just protect our lives. And they were primarily protecting their own interests, the Yucateco interests. Um, and they also, guys, the government of Yucatan at this point called all men from 16 to 60 
to go and serve in the, in the military, banned the sale of guns and alcohol to the Maya. And to an extent, they were removing all the rights uh, from the Maya um, themselves. They banned this, the sale, as you had stated, of ammunition. But as I had stated clearly earlier, that the, the, the Maya were also involved in trading with the British, right? And of course, initially there were some negotiations happening um, where they wanted peace. The Yucatecos were sort of, you know, basically stating, hey, come on, you, you know, let's have peace in our area. But the Maya were already too, um, we could say, hyped up to an extent because they wanted a free nation. One of the early things that they wanted was to avoid all of this systematic oppression and have a own, uh, their own or, or a say in their own affairs, which would be self-determination. And the peace offers were rejected. And at this point, by 1848, nearly one year after this war had begun, the Yucatecos were quite desperate and the Yucatecos were basically at the mercy of the Maya forces. However, guys, although, as I had stated, the Yucatecos were at this point at the mercy of the Maya, the Yucatecos were basically still given an opportunity to survive. And the reason for it was primarily because the Maya did not attack Merida or Campeche, which were the centers of power of the Yucatecos. And even though you, Valladolid was, was evacuated, the Maya did not necessarily make a large effort to take over those areas surrounding Valladolid. And that particularly gave the Yucatecos uh, the ability to respond. Um, secondly, the Maya as well, guys, many of these soldiers, um, just as had happened with the Grito de Dolores, many of these soldiers were actually farmers, right? These were farmers that were fighting to defend their lands. And many of them, when the war had started, were of course taking guns and ammunitions to go to fight. But many of them this began to uh, not necessarily run away, but to leave the army itself, the Maya army, to go back and plant and produce their own food. So, and remember, these are all soldiers that have um, that, that are to an extent voluntarily coming forward. So the generals could not have strict control over the soldiers, and many of them were going back to the Milpa farming. Of course, this was weakening the Maya forces. And lastly, what you will note is that the Yucatecos managed to resurge primarily because they get aid from Mexico. In fact, Mexico gives them a deal that if they join back the Mexican Federation, they were going to come and help them fight against uh, the Maya. And the, the Maya in this case, guys, were not well prepared and did not respond as quickly as they should have to the Mexican army and the unification with the Yucateco forces. So this is where we're at so far. Uh, again, the Maya attacked, or the Maya were planning the attack, sorry. The Yucatecos attacked, killed one of the Maya leaders. Then the Yucatecos attacked Cecilio, Cecilio Chi and his farm. Then you will note that the Maya attack and they basically take over and expand way to the southeast. And then reaching way up to Bacalar, and they have the Yucatecos, we could say, with their backs to the wall. So the Yucatecos, as I had stated, guys, although they were losing this particular confrontation, they were also given the opportunity to uh, gather their forces once more. And along with the help of international aid, guns and ammunition, the Mexican aid, and also mercenaries that were being brought in, some of them from the US, they began to push back. At this point, and again, we're talking about just one, merely one or two years after the war itself. Um, at this point, guys, the, the Maya were already divided. Actually, they, were, they, they had violent disagreements amongst each other. And um, there were leaders trying um, attacking each other within the Maya um, group as well. Um, Cecilio Chi was murdered. The leaders began to break away from each other. And of course, the division between the Maya was serving the interests of the Yucatecos. By 1848, a mere year after it had started, the Yucatecos managed to take back Teosuco 
and also Bacalar. And with this, they were also stopping the trade um, with the British. So again, it was quite quickly and swiftly that the Maya managed to take control of the area, but swiftly was also the response of the Yucatecos who initially were very desperate, but with help and aid we could see, they managed to fight back. And now by 1848, they had taken Teosuko, taken Bacalar back. So these are the areas, um, Bacalar around here and Teosuko was right around there. With the Yucatecos taking control of some of the territory, um, the Maya basically began to retreat. Um, the Maya began to retreat a bit back. Um, actually, the, the, the Yucatecos were so, or were becoming so successful that in one of those attacks, also the Yucatecos managed to defeat the Maya and take over an amount of them. And they decided to send these persons, the, the Maya that were captured as slaves to Cuba. Actually, I think recently there was a, I'm not sure about which year, but there was a recent research or publication about the Maya in Cuba that were, that were sent there. And by 1849, guys, the Maya leaders uh, begin to speak with the British to ask for their independence. So there's a bit of, you know, the, the Maya are now sort of saying, all right, Michael, you know, let's try to see how we can negotiate something up. And although the Yucatecos were advancing, some of the Maya were still resisting. And although the Maya were already sort of, we could say, their resistance was going um, a bit lower and lower, it is at this point when the Maya were already um, getting weakened, we could say, that a cross, a tiny cross, appeared to Jose Maria Barrera. Jose Maria Barrera was one of the Maya resisting. And that particular talking cross appeared to him and instructed him, inspired him for them to continue resisting against the Yucateco forces. By this point, and there was also division between the two major groups, the Caiche and the, and the Santa Cruz Maya. But the Crusoe guys, inspired by this talking cross, which is coincidentally where uh, the major city was established, Chan Santa Cruz, um, that particular cross inspired them to continue fighting. And look at the time frame, guys. We're talking about them continuing that fight way up to 1901. So this was a crucial turning point. Um, some also consider, consider this to just be a myth. Some consider it to be the truth. Some consider it to have, to have happened and be real. But of course, be it whatever, it was something that inspired the Maya to continue fighting back against the Yucatecos. Um, at this point, as I had stated, guys, by some years later, you will note that the divisions were already happening from, from early on. But by 1853, there were negotiations occurring where the Ikaiche Maya in particular wanted to separate from the Santa Cruz Maya. The Ikaiche Maya were already tired of this warfare, and they entered into negotiations um, with the mayor of, of, of Flores Petén and the... And, um, representatives from the Yucatecos. At this point, guys, the Maya, the, the Santa Cruz Maya, were quite upset about this. And the Santa Cruz Maya actually attacked and burned Chichen Ha, which was the capital of the Ikaiche. But even though that happened, the Ikaiche continued and went on to basically sign a peace treaty with the Yucatecos, sign a peace treaty with the joint Yucateco and Mexicans, you could say. By 1853, the British served as the mediators. And um, the Maya were granted, the Kaiche Maya were granted control over their lands. They were allowed to have a standing army and to get guns and ammunition. They did not have to pay taxes to the Yucateco government and they were governed by their own leaders. So basically they were granted their little um, territory, control over their territories, but in exchange, they had to stop fighting against the Yucatecos. Of course, guys, this particular situation is what basically led them into, again, this was a war happening, into another little war happening within the Casuar. Because of course, the Crusoe Maya were not happy about this. And the Crusoe or Santa Cruz Maya immediately went into attacking the Ikaiche area, into the, into the Ikaiche territory. And of course, there were several confrontations happening where they would come in, try to take control of Chichen Ha, and burn down the whole territory, 
and um, then go back. This also, guys, was one of the factors that led for many of the um, Ikaiche, as you can see the Ikaiche area here, to migrate farther and farther into British Honduras. Um, Denmark, uh, yes. the the um, the territory of the Ikaiche, uh, whereby they 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 were they were given the control of the land. That land was in part <clears throat> in the territory, right, of Belize. Yes, yes, that land was in part in the territory of Belize. Actually, um, the Ikaiche, although they're known as Los Pacificos in the Yucatan area. When it comes to British Honduras itself, we're going to talk about them later on, right? In the second segment of this presentation. When it comes to this territory, they were known as Los Bravos. And the reason for it is because they were becoming very violent towards the British when the British were encroaching into their territory to the point where the British, even the British had to pay them rent for going and extracting Lagood and Mahogany from those territories. So the territory that we're referring to relates not only to parts of Yucatan, but also parts of, um, British Honduras, that's that's the territory that they took control of. Um, of course, although the decision was made there, um, some of these, uh, the decision basically applied to the, to the Ikaiche territory within Yucatan itself, not necessarily within uh, British Honduras itself. And the reason for it is because later on they make another treaty and that yes involves the British. Where were we, here? Oh. So again, as I had stated, guys, the, the, the Crusoe were not happy with this particular confrontation, with, with this particular decision by the Ikaiche, and the Crusoe continued attacking. Um, there are a number of, uh, of attacks that are happening. Um, in 1858, they took back Bacalar and collected taxes from woodcutters and others in the area. And again, you will note that in 1863, another confrontation happens. And there was just a constant attack by the, the, the Crusoe Maya against the Ikaiche Maya. And at this point, they're still fighting against the, the Yucatecos as well, right? So again, by now you will note by 1858, that's 10 years after the warfare started. 11 years, sorry, 1863. So you will note that this, this war is just going on and on for a long period of time. And although there are talks of peace, in Italy, the Maya were not um, going to accept any subjugation per se. By 1884, as I had stated, there were several cases of, of um, negotiations. By 1884, the Yucatecos, the Crusoe, and the British basically begin to negotiate for a culmination of this battle or th this particular war. Um, actually, they had made the decision to, to have um, a cease in fire and, and negotiate, negotiate towards peace, right? However, while they were celebrating this particular uh, moment, the governor of Yucatan got drunk and the governor of Yucatan basically held the Crusoe leader by his shirt and also poured um, uh, some alcohol on his shirt. And that eventually just escalated the whole, the whole problem again and the war continued on. But one of the things that is very important about this particular war that relates to Belize is that in the context of this war guys, is where you have the Spencer Mariscal Treaty being signed in 1893, it was ratified in 1895. But what this was doing is that it was basically outlining the borders, the Northern borders of Belize. And this was guys, the Mexican um, authorities now telling the British, look, this war won't end if you don't stop selling guns and ammunition to the Maya. At this point, the British agree and uh, basically agree to not selling any more um, guns and ammunition to the Maya in exchange that these borders right here would be recognized as the limits for British Honduras. This particular moment, guys, debilitated the Maya resistance a lot, actually. Um, the Maya uh, were now with limited weapons. They were now having a lot of enemies. And even, uh, even though they were putting a lot of resistance, they were unable to withhold their resistance. Uh, by 1901, the Yucateco and Mexican forces, by now it, it will be the Mexican forces, um, went into Chan Santa Cruz, took control of Chan Santa Cruz. And although there were um, small skirmishes of the war happening throughout, eventually it is at this point 
when the war ends. The caste war basically ends. And of course, leaving um, the whole territory, we could say uh, up to radical change. One, because of migration, you will note the economic impacts, the political impacts of all of these um, confrontations. But um, although uh, we do not celebrate a war, what you will note is that it shaped the history of the region. It shaped the history of Belize. In fact, my community, San Antonio, um, was created as a result of the caste war. And that's the reason why many of us should know the history of the caste war, because it's innately the story of our ancestors. Thank you. Any questions? I had a question. Um, when you were talking about the Mayas attacking, um, why didn't they attack Campeche and, and Merida? Were they not prepared or is there another reason? Well, uh, it is not clear actually. It is not clear as to why they were, they were not um, attacking the centers of power. In fact, I think I mentioned it quite clearly. Um, but part of the reason was because their armies were basically made of volunteers. And what they wanted to do also was to establish control in the Southern areas. That's the areas that they wanted to take control of. There are also some theories stating that um, they were not well prepared as it relates to tactics to attack those areas, which are of course, to an extent, those were areas that would give a lot more challenges, primarily because that's where the centers of power for the Yucatecos were. Thank you. Um, Mr. Delma, uh, the, 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 when the Santa Cruz uh, burns down Chachen, how they move and establish uh, their capital becomes Santa Clara, is that right? Where, um, my question is, is Santa, was Santa Clara, it's within British Honduras or was it outside the, the, the present day boundaries? Which are, which are you talking? The, you're the, referring to the Santa Cruz Maya or the Caiche? The Caiche, Santa Clara, the Caiche. Oh, okay. Um, and, the, and also another question, there is a Santa Clara in Corozal. Is there any links uh, to, probably to that, to the Caiche? Okay. I would need to check my data and, and to, to, to give you a direct answer to that. I'm not certain, but um, again, many of the names for the, for the villages that were created are actually very contemporary. In fact, there were a lot of um, priests coming in the early 1900s and they were the ones who were giving many of the names to the, particularly to the Maya villages in Belize. So, but I, of course I can, I can give a direct answer. I, I have the answer to that, but I, I am not certain. So I don't want to give you a wrong answer. A question, uh, the question in the chat about the Henneken, is that a tequila plant? No, 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 it's, it's, it's a family to it though. Henneken, um, it's not the agave, agave is the tequila one. This Henneken is, is mostly used for its fibers, which is, its fibers are very strong. And um, that's the reason why it was a preferred, uh, you could say the, the preferred raw product for the creation of ropes, particularly in the ship uh, industry. Any other question? Ms. Uh, Delmer, can you give us previews of, of coming attractions for Wednesday? Well, um, on Wednesday, what we're going to be talking about is basically the impact of the casuar in, in this region. And, and one of the things that I always tend to highlight, and some people still can't believe it or, or don't want to accept it, is the fact that the caste war occurred in Belize as well. The caste war occurred in the territory of British Honduras as well. And um, there were confrontations here, although it was, you could say, in the surrounding territory, it did occur here, where the Maya that were migrating were directly involved in confronting the British here. Although it was not directly the caste war, there were some um, very real impacts in this area. 
So we're going to be talking about that. We're also going to be talking about um, Marcos Canul, who was um, also one of the Ikaiche leaders and the person that led, we could say, some of the most prominent uh, resistance uh, activities in British Honduras. And also we're going to fi finalize by talking about, I'm not sure, David, have you shared the, the story of Palmar to your students? Yes. Yeah, they should, they should be um, acquainted with it for, by next class, no? So I told okay. them to read, to read it. Yes, story. so um, as I stated early on, there were different phases in this period of colonization. And um, by the late 1900s and early 1900s, that's when we could say the Maya were basically now almost fully adapted into the colonial system that the British imposed. So that's the story that we're going to be looking at in our upcoming session. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Delmer Sid, for um, that presentation and the casuar. Will you be sharing? Uh, is it the same PowerPoint presentation I have? No, um, it's, a here? no. One. it's a different one. I always change things. Okay. <laughs> Will, will yeah. you change? Will you send it to, to me so that we can post it? Yes, of course. Mind? Okay. Sure, sure I can. And um, students can go over it. And if you have any questions for Wednesday, you can bring your questions. And we look forward to having um, Delmer again with us on Wednesday and all of you, of course, at the same time, 4.30. So thank you very much to all and have a very good evening. <laughs>